feel with this stuff? Not good. I don't know not doing All right. Okay. No, don't do that. Now, there's a... <laughs> now, there's a couple things I want you guys to remember. First off, we're not doing real trig proofs yet, right? These are, we're just doing technique. Like, that's all we're doing is we're... We're learning some different techniques so that we can eventually do some real proofs. Like that's not, we're not to those yet. But I also need you guys to understand a couple things. One, everybody's going to experience this feeling. And that is you're going to come into class one day and you're going to say, you know, when you do this and I watch you, it makes sense. Like I can follow it. It just seems to, like I see it. And it, you just make it look so easy. But when I get by myself and I get st stuck, like I, it's really, really hard. Everybody's going to experience that. Now, it's for basically three reasons. One, I'm damn good at these. Like, I just, you know, I'm so good. It's like it's hard for me to, you know, step back and just not make it look easy. Like, I'm just so good, <laughs> right? Okay. But seriously, the other reason is one, the other reason, well, it's two, you need a lot of practice. The only good way, to, the only way you get good at anything really is you need more and more practice. The more practice you get, the better you're going to be at these, okay? The third thing is I have my identities memorized. The better you have those identities memorized, the easier these will be for you. Remember, my goal with you memorizing these is not to memorize them. You know, why did I have you memorize the table, the 30, 45, 60 table? It's easy. it's easy. We use it a lot. It helps us, like, estimate other answers. And they're, they're common. Like, we see them in a lot of times, right? They're numbers that pop up a lot. I don't want you to memorize these identities for the same reasons. Why? Why do I want you to memorize these? But you have the the reason you have to memorize them is you have to recognize things when you come across them. It's basically like you're lost. You're driving down the road and you're just lost. And all of a sudden you come to a tree and you go, I know that tree. I've seen that tree. I know that tree. I, that's the tree I swung on when I was a kid. Like, I know where I'm at now. If you don't recognize that tree when you see it, then that tree doesn't help you, right? These proofs are kind of the same idea. You have to recognize things when you see them, and that is going to help you move forward with the, these ideas. You also have to remember these kind of problems, these are totally different types of math problems than you've ever done in any math class, right? Like these are just totally different concepts of I'm not trying to solve for X. I'm not trying to get an answer. I'm just trying to connect the dots. Yes. Well, that works as long as you can find somebody. You don't got service. You know, no, I, you know I, I do really like you guys. I really do. But I don't want phone calls on how to do trick proofs at 10 o'clock at night. Like, you know, it just... Why not? Yeah, why not? <laughs> what? Um, yeah, I, that's my time to watch cartoons. Okay. <laughs> Now, let's go through the homework. Before we go through the homework, how many of you took the time yesterday, like I told you in class, to write out your toolbox in multiple ways? A couple of you started it? Huh? I would do, no, I would do, there's, I will tell you right now. Your reciprocal identities, 
You have to know. Now, I would probably wager that you guys already have your reciprocal identities memorized. Like cosecant is the reciprocal, you know, one over sine. Like you have those memorized. Now, whether or not you have them memorized in multiple forms, okay, that might just take a little bit more practice. And guys, uh, remember, exams are coming up. You're probably going to ask me about a note card. You have, you've had other teachers let you use note cards in the past, right? Do you want to know the real secret of why most teachers let you use a note card? Huh? No. Uh -uh. <laughs> Has nothing to do with raising your grade. Has nothing to do with making you study that night. It's brain research. It's simple brain research. Because if you write it down, you remember it. How many times have you written out a note? Or written out a note. It's great English. Written a note card out for an exam. You get to the exam, and you don't ever actually look at the, ex the note card because you already know what's on there, right? That happens all the time. Why? Because if you simply take the time to write it out, it sticks in your brain. Like, that's just brain research. There's actually research that's proven, a lot of elementary teachers use it, that like if, when they're teaching how to write, like the letter A and the letter B, right? They'll take a piece of screen out of a window, put it on the desk, put your paper on the desk, and then use a crayon. And what would that, that screen would make it harder to pull your crayon, right? Because you're using more muscle power to write, it actually sticks in your brain better. That's just weird brain research. If you take the time to write out your note card, it will help you remember it. That's why I want you to do it. That's why teachers let you use note cards on exams. It's to trick you into studying. And you go, I'm going to fill out this note card so I can use it on the exam. I know, everybody knows, you're probably never going to look at that note card because you're going to remember what's on it already. So that's why I want you to write out the, note, the toolbox so that it'll help you remember it in multiple forms. Okay? I don't know. Probably. There's a good chance. Good chance. We'll talk about that later. No. Okay. The, back to your toolbox. Your reciprocal identities, absolutely have to know those. But you probably already have them memorized. Your ratio identities. Tangent, sine over cosine. Absolutely have to know that. No question about it. Now, when I say that, you have to know this one. The second one, you can actually survive without it. How on earth could I survive without it? If you run across a cotangent, if I don't have that tool, what else could I do? I could change it into 1 over tangent, couldn't I? If I came across the cotangent, couldn't I turn it into 1 over tangent? And then couldn't I turn that into 1 over sine over cosine? And then simplify that complex fraction into this? Yes? Couldn't I just do that? Can I survive without this one? Yes. What does having this other tool in my toolbox help me, though, do? It makes it faster. It makes it a one step to go straight from here to here instead of two or three steps. That's what that tool does for you. Okay? It's kind of a, a just the more tools, the faster you can work, the easier, the you know, more things you can recognize. Same thing with your Pythagorean. You are going to use sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1 a hundred times in the near future. And not just in that form. You absolutely have to know sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. You also have to know 
sine squared equals? One minus cosine squared. And likewise, cosine squared is going to equal one minus sine squared. You have to know those. You cannot survive these proofs without those three. Then the other two, the one plus cotangent squared, the one plus sec or one plus tangent squared, one plus cotangent squared, those, yeah. you can survive without them. You really can. But if you don't have them, you're going to end up using these, and it's going to be similar to this, where instead of going in one step, bam, right to there to there, it might take you three, four, five steps to get there. You will eventually get there, but it's just going to take you longer. So those are, to me, shortcut tools. Does that kind of make sense? Similar to number two. This was the first problem of your homework, right? What was the first problem of the homework? It was cosecant plus one, cosecant minus one, and that's supposed to equal cotangent squared. This is a two-step problem. And I will tell you right now, if you ever, there's certain things that I'm going to keep pointing out and saying, if you see this, it should be like a bright flashing red light. Look at me, look at me. Use me. If you see Basically the same thing, plus and minus. Everybody should be thinking one thing and one thing only. Foil because this is a difference of two squares, isn't it? Like, I will tell you right now, if you see that, nine times out of ten, that's the direction you should go. Now, is there going to be a couple problems that kind of trick you into, ooh, that's a difference of two squares. I should use that here. And then you go down that rabbit hole and it's just a bad, bad method. Yeah, that's going to happen. But you're going to need, if you see difference two squares, absolutely, that's exactly what you should be thinking. If you foil that out, what does that come out to? Cosecant squared minus one. Now, if you have the tool in your toolbox, what does... 1 plus cotangent squared equal, in, on page 133, what's the tool in our toolbox? 1 plus cotangent squared equals cosecant squared, which means I can use this tool in a different form, and what's the next step? I go right to cotangent squared, and I'm done, right? I absolutely, this is what I would expect most people to write there. Now, here's what I meant a minute ago about you can survive without that tool. If you didn't have that tool in your toolbox, is there something else I could have done here? Is there, is there something else that I know? When I see cosecant, I think of something else. I think of one over sine. What if I did that? Okay. Well, now I look at this and I look at this and I go, I got two things. I got to make it one, right? So maybe find a common denominator, jam those two things together. What's my common denominator? Sine squared. So this one doesn't change, right? Minus that one would be sine squared over sine squared, right? Do you recognize the 1 minus sine squared now? What's 1 minus sine squared? That's cosine squared, isn't it? And cosine squared over sine squared is cotangent squared. That's another way to get there. Now, so I would just one more step and I'm there, right? How did I get from here to here? Right here. I just said in our toolbox, you have to know sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1, right? And then that in another form, sine squared is 1 minus cosine squared, or cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared. So I have a 1 minus sine squared. I can replace that with cosine squared. Now, Reagan, will you re repeat what you just said about this? 
Okay. I'm going to agree and disagree with you at the same time on that statement. She said, what this, by me doing this, that just made it a whole lot harder. For you, what you're going to struggle with the most is recognizing things. And everybody recognizes things differently, right? Like when you drive down the road, some people look at that a certain tree and they know that tree. They know that certain rock. They know, what, they know where they're at there. Some people look at this, and the hard part is, man, when you do it, it makes sense. I can follow you. But me, I would never recognize. A lot of people with this problem, they got to here, right? And they just didn't recognize that I can go straight from there to there. Because they don't have that tool memorized yet. They have the tool memorized to go to there. So that when they see it, they think of that. Some, that's what you have to understand. And that's why whenever we do homework in class, and, and I promise you I'm going to keep doing this, every single problem you ever ask me in class, you better be prepared for me to turn it right back on you. If you ask me to do number 10, I'm going to write it on the board, and I'm going to ask you a very simple question. What do you see? Because I, I don't want you to go down my rabbit holes. I want you to do things the way I would do them. I want you to do them the way you see. I'm going to try to go down your rabbit hole and see if we can get there. Because those are the rabbit holes that you see. Now, if I ask Emma... How, what does she see? And she sees me some weird path. Let's go down that path. I, don't, I Honestly, I have no idea sometimes if we're going to get there that way. <laughs> Let's see what happens. Sometimes we'll get there. Sometimes we'll get four or five steps down. And guess what I'm going to say? Uh, this is not going the way we should. Let's just start over and try something different. There is two things every year that I know students have to have in order to be successful with this stuff. And if either one of these two things falls short, I can tell you right now, you will not be successful. Number one is you have to have a basic, good basic foundation in your basic algebra skills. Factoring, foiling, completing, or simplifying complex fractions, those types of things. If you don't have those basic skills down, you're just gonna make simple math errors and you're going to get all lost every once in a while, and you'll never get there, okay? Number one, you have to have that. Most of you, I can already tell you, you have that. The second thing you have to have, and this is on you. I can't give this to you. You have to have what our elementary teachers call grit. You have to be what I call math stubborn. And math stubborn is a compliment. What math stubborn means is you have to be willing to start a problem. Get a few steps in, and it may or may not be going your way, and you go, I'm going to start over. How many of you honestly can say you've ever done that? Where most people, they try it two or three steps, and if it's not going their way, they go, well, couldn't get that one, let's move on to the next one. If that's the attitude, I can tell you right now, it's not going to work out for you. You have to be willing to get frustrated. You have to be willing to work through a problem. Sometimes it takes that little extra push. Because you're going to get lost. Everybody's going to get lost. And if you quit, the second you get lost, you're not going to find your way back through. You have to be willing. Has anyone ever just taken a random route to drive? just to see what happens and to see what, I've never been down here. Let's see what happens. You have to be willing to get lost. I'll find my way eventually. I'll, I'll find, you know, I'll figure out a way to get back to where I was. Uh, the up above the ceiling, there's a, actually a big, like, the weirdest thing that I've, 
in being in this classroom that trips me out every time they do it. The custodians will come in, they'll put a ladder up through there, and they just climb up and disappear. Like there's a giant open area up there. No. <laughs> but yeah, that's all there is. Okay. <laughs> all right. What's another problem you want to do? We have only done one. Number four. Number four. Order. Whatever. One plus tangent. And again, guys, I will, and I promise I will. I will do any and all problems you want me to do. But I do ask one thing. I just ask that you try them first. You try them once, okay. I really want you to try them at least twice. And if you just can't get there, then I will absolutely help you. Just don't ask questions that you haven't tried yet. Because I really want to be able to say, who just asked me this question? Olivia? Who said do them in order? All right, so Emma said, can you do number four? I'm going to turn around and say, Emma, how far did you get? What did you do first? Did you see anything? Foiled it. Great. What led you to think foiling? Because foiling is absolutely a great idea. Maybe Lacey didn't catch that. What, what made you think foil? Anything jump out at you? Parentheses? Great. The parentheses over here. There's no parentheses over there. Got to get rid of the parentheses. So, yeah, let's see what happens with a foil. I saw a plus and a minus. Kind of was thinking difference of two squares. It's not exactly because they're not the same thing. There's two things jumping out at me. One, kind of difference two squares situation, kind of, right? Two, aren't I going to multiply a tangent times a cotangent? And what is tangent times cotangent? It's one. Because tangent and cotangent are reciprocals of each other. Anytime you multiply a number by its reciprocal, it's going to be one. Great, let's see what happens. Foil it out. One times one is one. One times negative cotangent would be negative cotangent, which is a great thing because I got a negative cotangent over there. And then I got tangent times one, which is tangent. Well, that's also a great thing because I need a tangent. And then what's tangent times negative cotangent? Negative one. What happens to my ones? They go. And I got a negative cotangent. I got a positive tangent. I'm going to flip them around just so they match. And it looks better with the positive one in front. And I'm done. So it's just a foiling problem. And again, when I ask you those questions, why did I just ask Emma? She said, let's foil. Why was I very specifically asking her, what made you think foil? Because some people didn't pick up on that. There's nothing that's going to say, foil this out first. So if you saw it, what made you think that so that somebody else might see it next time? All right. What are we on? Number six. That's just a factoring question. Do I have to do that one? Yes, just do that one. What? For six? All right, I'm going to do this one really fast. Six. So this is number six. I'm going to do this one really fast. This is just factor, factor. The top difference two squares. It's sine plus six, sine minus six. The bottom, sine plus six, sine minus six, or sine plus six, sine plus six. Those cancel, and you're done. Now, what made me think Factor, factor. I looked and I saw a difference two squares. I saw a trinomial. Guys, if when you see in any walk of life, x squared plus 12x plus 36, when you see that, 
you should immediately, no matter what you're doing, think factor. Right? Like that's just should jump in your head. The same reason why when you see the number 144, what jumps in your head? 12. Like it just automatically jumps. Like for some weird reason, there's no reason that when you see the number 144, that the number 12 jumps in your head. When you see this, something like this, absolutely you should be thinking factor. When I see something like that, yeah, let's factor, see what happens. The other th reason is look at the other side. Look what they tell you to put it into. When you see the other side, use the other side to help you factor it. Like they tell you, we know what's got to be left over. That's how I would actually do number uh, 10. Because number 10, honestly, is one simple question. It comes down to one thing and one thing only. Do you know how to factor the numerator? If you know how to factor the numerator, this is an easy question. If you don't, this is a hard question. But can you use the right side to help you. Yeah. Because I look at this and go, all right, the denominator is easy, right? Yeah. Tangent plus 4, tangent minus 4. Okay. Now, let's think about this for a second. What do I need to end up with here? Plus 4, plus four in the bottom, which means what's going to have to be on top to cancel? Well, there better be a tangent minus 4 up here, because that's got to cancel that, right? Okay, so that's going to be gone. What am I probably going to be left with here, guys? <laughs> that! And that's exactly what it factors into. Now, if you knew the rule we talked about yesterday of your cube root, so that's tangent, your cube root negative 64, so that's negative 4, you square the first, opposite the product, right? Square the second, that's an easy problem, but you can still get there, at least with your fingers crossed and go, I think this is right. You know? By, use that. That should help you. Down here? So, what's the cube root of tangent cubed? That's tangent. What's the cube root of negative 64? Negative 4. And then you go the first one squared, opposite the product. So you multiply the negative 4 and the tangent, and you do opposite. That's why it's plus. And then the negative 4 squared, so that's where the 16 comes from. But again, if you knew that rule we talked about yesterday of the sum and difference of cubes, that should be a pretty easy question, right? That's exactly how you do number 12. Yep, 12 is exactly the same. 18, yes. Now remember the goal here. Yep, remember, are we doing proofs right now? No. We're practicing techniques. There's nothing on the right side right now. There's nothing we're even trying to get it to match right now. What we're saying is, on the right side, I see sine squared plus 2 sine over sine minus 4, right? I see a whole bunch of what? Signs. I'm not trying to get it to match anything. What's my only goal here? Get it to sign. Right? This is what I started doing. Okay. You left the tangent. All right, interesting. Because I wouldn't have, but okay. Ooh, I like that idea. Ooh, now I'm going to ask you something real specific now. Why on earth would you change that? And why am I asking that question? It's already sign. What's the only purpose of this question? What's the only goal of this question? 
to get it into sign, isn't it? Isn't that part already sign? Yeah. I'm going to leave that thing alone. I'm not even going to touch that unless I have to. I'm going to just keep doing this. Because that's already done, right? Now, maybe I have to use it. I don't know. Maybe I'll have to do a common denominator or something, or who knows. But there ain't no way I'm touching that first. I'm leaving that thing alone. Now, I loved what you did here. I don't agree with leaving the tangent. I didn't know what to do with it. What can I do with tangent? That gets me closer to sine. Because I could go 1 over cotangent. How about sine over cosine? So sine squared over cosine squared. So that's what I get to on that first step, right? What happens if you multiply? What happens to my cosines? They just cos they just cancel and I'm right down to Am I done for this problem now? What trig functions do I have? I'm good. Now, if this was a real trig proof, there would have been something on the right side. And at this point, I would start trying to get them to match. Maybe I got to factor this side. Maybe I got to find a common denominator and go from there. I don't know. But we're not doing the real proof. We're only practicing step one. Step one is if I notice there's a whole bunch of just one trig function over here, that's my first goal. Get it into that trig function, and then I'll try to match them. Cool? Yeah. Now, is this the only answer you can have? No, there's probably other ways to do this that you absolutely could have done. You know, you... Heck, you could have went crazy and said tangent squared. Well, I know 1 plus tangent squared is secant squared. So tangent squared would be what? Secant squared minus 1? You could have done something like that if you wanted to. And what would have even made me think to do that? Because of the 1 over secant. Well, hey, let's get it to secant. And I'm going to leave that. This I'm going to still leave alone because it's already sine. Well, now let's distribute. What's secant squared times 1 over secant squared? Well, that's just 1 minus, right? So maybe you thought to do something like that. I don't know, right? So there's going to be other answers. Like, I'm not done. I'd still have to figure out a way to get that into a sign. So, you know, now maybe I change it into cosine squared and go from there, find a common denominator. There's probably another answer. But that's what I kind of mean by go down the rabbit holes that you see. Some of you would say sine squared over cosine squared. Great, that was a great idea. It worked out perfect. Some of you would say, well, I see the secant. Let's go to secant because I can do that with tangent squared right away. And let's see what happens. All right, what other ones do you want? What do you got, Seth? 14. 14. So 14 says 1 over cosine squared minus 1 over cotangent squared. That's supposed to just equal 1. Okay. What jumps at you? Uh, anybody. I don't care. All right, so that changed to secant squared. I like that because at least I'm not dealing with a fraction anymore. And that's tangent squared. Okay, I like that. And if you have that identity memorized, bam, you're done. That's a fast way of doing that. That's not the only way. Some people would have said, you know what, I despise, absolutely despise my reciprocal functions. I don't like secants, I don't like cosecants, I don't like cotangents, right? I want to deal with sine and cosine. I'm going to leave that cosine alone. Not even going to touch it. 
This I know is tangent, and I know tangent is sine squared over, right? Maybe you want to do this. Everybody follow me on this one? So all I did was I changed that to tangent. Tangent sine over cosine, right? I already have a common denominator. So on the numerator, I have 1 minus sine squared over cosine squared. And now, what's 1 minus sine squared? That's cosine squared. And now it's 1, right? Now, guys, please, everybody stop doing what you're doing and just please look. Some people are going to look at this and go, that's a lot more complicated. Some people are going to look at this and go, you know, I like that. I would notice that one. I know it's a lot more steps, but I would see that one. I like the idea of just going to tangent. I like the idea of just going to sine and cosine. And then I know 1 over minus sine already. Like, I recognize that one. This might be the longer, easier route. And that's your route. How many of you, when you drive to Port Huron, honestly, like seriously, if you guys are driving to Port Huron, how many of you honestly most of the time take 136? Like turn left by Roadhouse 19 and you go that way. How many of you take Yale Road pretty much all the way to the water and then you turn right? Okay. How many of you take the expressway? You go to Emmett, jump on the expressway. Great. Which way is better? Whichever way you like better. Whichever way you know. Some people, do they try to take 136 and they get lost. And they turn in the wrong spots. You need to go the way you know. The way you'll not get lost. Even if it's not the direct fast way. That's what I'm saying about these proofs. All right, what else you got? 20? Okay. I just don't quite get those ones. It's like, how do you find the other side? Okay. Immediately, the 1 minus cosine equals the other side. Okay. No. No, 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 no. Everybody, please pay attention real quick. I want everybody to look at page 133, your, your toolbox. Open up to your toolbox. If you have cosecant, are you allowed to replace that with 1 over sine? Yes. This identity, if you have cosecant squared, can you replace that with 1 over sine squared? Yes. If you, because the rule is, is not squared, you can use it when it's squared. Like, that's basic math. Like, you can do that. Now I want you to look at your Pythagorean identities, where it says sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Can you use it if you just have sine plus cosine? No. No. Your Pythagorean identities have to be squared in order to use them. If they're not squared, you are not allowed to use them. Which means, can I replace 1 minus cosine with sine? No, because that cosine is not squared. I cannot use that Pythagorean identity. But, look at, there should be something jumping at you. No, look what I have in my denominators. They're plus and a minus. I'm thinking difference of two squares. Great. What's my common denominator? What's my common denominator? I need a 1 minus cosine. I also need a 1 plus cosine. That is my common denominator. What's missing out of this denominator? 
the plus. the plus, the one plus. What was missing out of this denominator? The one minus. Now, when I add across, one plus one is two. What happens to my cosines? Cancel. I got a cosine plus a negative cosine, they gone. If I FOIL the bottom now, what am I going to have? Careful. 1 minus cosine squared. And what is 1 minus cosine squared? Sine squared. So I can get to 2 over sine squared. And now I have it in terms of sine. Can you FOIL that? Where? Here? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'd have 1 times 1 is 1. Yeah. I'm going to have a positive cosine. I'm going to have a negative cosine, which is why the middle term goes away. And then I'll have a negative cosine squared. Now, what made me think find a common denominator? Partly. I noticed the difference of two squares. And I thought, how can I get to where they're going to multiply? Well, what if I found a common denominator? That's what I would have to multiply them then. That's what made me think of it. 1 plus 1. This. Where? Here? I did. That's how I did the last step. Yeah, once I got to here, then it's the... The next step that I would write, yeah, it would be 2 over sine squared. Yeah, that's how I would end that one. For 18 and 20? No. I'm only trying to get it in terms of sine. Remember, my goal, these are ones where over here I might have some crazy junk, but it's all sign. Directions help. And like 20, I, I don't know what the right side is. All I know is it's a whole bunch of cosines. Yeah. Do you really want me to do it real quick or do you want me to walk through it? Because I can do these fast. If you really want me to do them quick. I will do it quick. Yeah. What's 1 minus sine squared? Cosine squared. And cosine over sine is cotangent. Like that's, that's the fast. It's just simply recognize that 1 minus sine squared is cosine squared. And then once I have cosine over sine, it's tangent. Which one did you ask, Emma? 12. It's just, do you know how to factor the cube? So, cotangent cubed plus 125 over cotangent squared minus 25. So that numerator, cube root of cotangent cubed is cotangent. Cube root of 125 is 5. Because 5 times 5 times 5 is 125. First one squared. Opposite the product. Second one squared. And that's what that's going to factor into. And then the bottom would just be cotangent plus, cotangent minus. And then these just cancel. 32, yep. 32. 32. All right, so... They want you to put tangent in terms of that weird identities they give you. Tangent is sine over cosine, right? 
All right, so what they say sine is? Sine is supposed to be this quantity a plus b squared over a minus b over a squared plus b squared over a squared minus b squared. It does. They want tangent. Tangent is sine over cosine. So I just put what they said sine is over what they said cosine is, right? Yeah. All right, now we gotta simplify that bad boy. I would look at this as A plus B, A plus B. Yeah. That bottom A minus B, not much I can do with that. I'm gonna bring this one up flip it upside down, and multiply, right? This a, minus, a squared minus b, that's going to go to the numerator, right? What does this factor into? What's a squared minus b squared factor into? Isn't that a plus b, a minus b? This part? That's the difference two squares? Does a squared plus b squared factor? No, sir. That does not factor in anything. We don't have a, there's no such rule that, it, nothing that a squared plus b squared equals. There's no sum of squares. There's a difference of squares, but not a sum of squares. So my a minus b is cancel, right? What am I left with? How many of these a plus b's do I have? Three of them. What do I have in the bottom? A squared plus B squared. And you're done. There's nothing else you can do to that. How I get the five? What number times itself three times gives you 125? Five times five times five. What? How did I get the five? What, what's the third root of cotangent to the third? It's cotangent. What's the third root of 125? What number multiplied by itself three times gives you 125? Five times five is 25. 25 times five is 125. Say that again? Yeah, 